Module E, creating an issue statement. Note, when we refer to issues, we're referring to arguments or points, not always the issue statement or question presented. In our practice case, there is only going to be one issue, but there are several arguments or points to be made about that issue. Remember pass from Module D? Previously, we talked about preparation, and now we're on to the anticipation, the decision as to what issues or points will be discussed in the brief. Anticipation is a brief writer's effort to determine how to frame the issues and develop a pellet strategy in a way that will best influence the judges who decide the case. This module is going to cover how to narrow the issues, frame the issues, state the issues, and arrange the issues. Just as you'd bet on what horse to win, you should bet on what issues you think will be dispositive on appeal. Select your best chance on appeal bearing in mind the standard of review for the issues you are evaluating. Remember, the first thing the court reads should be what the issue is and why you should prevail on that issue. Recall what I've said before about how many cases the judge hears each week and how they only have so much time to spend with each brief. Because of that, you want to only present the strongest arguments and you want to do it clearly and concisely to make it easier for the judge to rule for your client. Try to limit it to three or four no more. Be clear and be brief. Choosing bad issues destroys the credibility of good issues, so use only the strongest. As a practice note, it's important to know that most courts do allow that the phrasing of your issue statement or question presented does not need to be identical with that what was listed in the petition for review or notice of appeal. So craft a statement that is in your favor. Now that we've talked about narrowing the issues, let's move on and talk about framing the issues. To frame your issues, answer these three questions. Number one, what is this case, at its essence, about? Number two, why, given what this case is about, should my client have prevailed at the trial level? And number three, what do I think this court should do about it? Frame with care. A non-lawyer should be able to understand. Be an advocate by using the specifics of your case phrased in such a way that the court can answer it. Right within the standard of review, do not ignore it. And remember, your framework will provide a roadmap for the judge who reads your brief. Every brief should make its primary point within 90 seconds, but only about 1% of briefs actually do this. Briefs that do succeed allow the judge to understand the basic question, answer, and reasons for that answer within 90 seconds. To frame a good persuasive issue, you must put it up front, break it into separate sentences following a premise, premise, question form, weave in enough facts so the reader can truly understand the problem, and write it in such a way that there is only one possible answer. To do this, forget about beginning with whether. Forget about loading all points into one sentence. And forget making the issues as abstract as possible. For example, a good persuasive issue statement might read something like this. As Hanukkah Corporation planned and constructed its headquarters, the general contractor, Lawrence Construction Company, repeatedly recommended a roof membrane and noted that the manufacturer also recommended it. Even so, the roof manufacturer warranted the roof without the membrane. Now the manufacturer has gone bankrupt and the roof is failing. Is Lauren Construction jointly responsible with the insurer for the cost of reconstructing the roof? Some briefs would take 10 pages to deliver all of that information. You'd find tidbits strewn amid other facts and the judge would have to read slowly to glean the issue. For many brief writers, it is a matter of fear. Fear that if you put it all up front and the judge doesn't agree with your issue, then you are sunk. The problem with not stating the issue in a single way, and rather talking about the case and parties in a way that gives the judge several handles of the case, is that you end up with no clearly framed issues or clear theory of the case. The judge will just be frustrated with this unclear approach. The only thing that matters to the judge is what question he or she is supposed to answer. Now that we've talked about narrowing the issue and framing the issue, let's move on to talk about how you state the issue. Phrase your issues in a separate sentences. A widely followed convention is to have a one-sentence version of the issue. 
you don't have to follow that. Plus, trying to squeeze it all into one sentence omits important information and can lead to unreadable issues. You want it to be readable, but informative at the same time. Don't start with whether or any other interrogative word. A compromise between the single sentence and the rambling issue. Limit it to 75 words apiece. About 98% of the time, if you can't phrase your issue in 75 words, you probably don't know what the issue is. It takes a lot of work to frame one question. It can take hours of tweaking to get it just right, but any time you spend doing that when writing briefs will pay off. You're more likely to spot problems in your logic, you're more likely to keep the judge's attention, and you're explaining the question in bite-sized form. Write fair but persuasive issues that have only one answer. Cast each issue as a syllogism. Syllogisms are the basis of logical thought. You have a major premise stating the law, for example, all men are mortal. A minor premise presenting the facts that tie into that major premise, Socrates is a man. And a conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. But when cast as an issue statement, the conclusion becomes a question. The best issues end with question marks. A question looks and sounds objective even when it's gently slanted. Rather than pushing your answer, you're putting a question on the table. One caution about your major premise. You only need to state the law on your major premise if the judge needs to be reminded about the law. For example, you don't need a major premise that says, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution protects freedom of speech. Because everyone knows that. Don't waste part of your 75 words on that. Weave concrete facts into your issue statement so that you tell a story in a miniature, with names and all. But remember, you only want particulars that are important, the ones that help the reader understand the problem. Let's take a look at a few example issue statements. Bad example number one. The trial court committed reversible error by denying defendant's motion. This formation is useless. It tells the court nothing, and it is completely devoid of substance. Bad example number two. The trial court erred in giving flawed essential elements instructions to the jury and thereby denied the defendant due process and fundamental fairness since it is error to give the jury, within the essential element instructions, one statement containing more than one essential element of the crime and requiring of the jury simple and singular assent or denial of that compound proposition, fully capable of disjunctive answer, which if found pursuant to the evidence adduced, would exculpate the defendant. Exculpate, excuse me, I can't even say all of this. This formation is just as bad. It includes way too much information, it's confusing, and at times it uses completely incomprehensible language. Remember, you want to write your issues so that they inspire the answers you want. Nowhere else in your brief will you be able to present your legal contentions with such brevity. Let's take a look at a good example. In 1956, ABC manufactured and sold to Feldspar a hoist design for attachment to a free-swinging trolley system. Thirty years later, without ABC's knowledge, Troopster acquired the hoist, added a new motor, pulley and cable, and integrated the hoist into a fixed elevator dumbwaiter system. Is ABC liable for injuries resulting from the integration of its hoist into a system defectively designed by Troopster? This example shows that the major premise is not exactly law, but it is a major fact setting up the background. The minor premise provides additional facts, and the conclusion asks the question that the appellate court needs to answer. Good example number two. Maryland law prohibits the discharge of effluent to which a permit holder has added chlorine or chlorine-containing products. Zero Corporation is discharging un altered municipal tap water that contains chlorine added by the city. Are these discharges legal under Maryland law? In this example, the major premise helpfully reminds the judge of a particular law. The minor premise introduces facts tying into that law, and the conclusion phrases a question that the judges need to answer. Let's take a look at one more good example. 
Under Mississippi Discovery Rules, computer stored information is as freely discoverable as tangible written materials. Even though the defendant's second request for production asked for computer stored information, the state refuses to search its computers for relevant information. Given that a search for this computer stored information would not entail any more effort than searching for tangible written materials, should this court compel the state to produce it? In this example, the major premise reminds the judge of a particular law. The minor premise introduces facts tying into that law. And again, the conclusion phrases a question that the judges need to answer. A quick what-if scenario. What if you have multiple issues? With multiple issues, preface each with a concise, neutral heading. See the bold brief heading before the full issue statement for that particular issue? This is really just a stylistic item, but if you have multiple issues, it can be effective to provide a neutral label for each. This is an effective way to help the judge identify what you're going to talk about right away. It also helps break up the text. Alright, let's quickly review what we've learned about writing issue statements. Do not phrase in the form of a weather statement. Do not try to pack everything into one sentence. Do use declarative sentences and conclude with the question. Do limit your issue statements to 75 words. Do weave facts into the issue and follow major premise plus minor premise plus question. Do write the question so that there is only one possible answer and do describe the issues fairly. At this point, we've talked about narrowing the issues, framing the issues, and stating the issues. So the only thing we have left to cover is arranging the issues. Lead with your killer issue or point. Do this by answering what argument, objectively considered, based on precedent and previously stated policy concerns of the court, is most calculated to persuade the court to your point of view. Remember, you're trying to persuade, and if you don't lead with your strongest argument, the judges might assume that all other arguments are even weaker and will stop reading. The only time you won't lead with your strongest argument is if there are preliminary matters, such as jurisdiction or some other procedural question. Once you decide your lead issue, how do you decide what comes next? The issue should be listed in order of importance. If you cannot resist including a throwaway issue, save it until last. At times, the arguments must be listed in logical order. Often a series of syllogisms is linked, with conclusions of previous ones forming the premise of those which follow. CAUTION! Where one point follows the other in logical order, the statement of issues takes a form of an inverted pyramid. This means that if you lose the top or fattest issue, then you lose the entire argument because each point is dependent on the previous one. So, if possible, construct your brief with points that are independent of each other. Then the court has alternative basis for its decision. So if the judges reject one premise, you can still be successful on another ground.